Go Jump in the Pool by Jordan Corman. What's on the menu? $844.50, Bruno announced as the last quarter clicked into the bucket. It was Sunday morning, and he and Booth were seated on the floor of their room, counting the proceeds from the talent show. What's that dollar in your hand? Booth asked accusingly. Royalties for inventing the ugliest man in the world skit? Of course not, Bruno, Bruno replied, highly insulted. Miss Scrimmage is going to the Royal Ontario Museum tomorrow, and Kathy's going to buy us a lottery ticket while she's in town. A hundred thousand bucks. That'll pay for it four times over. I don't suppose it ever occurred to you that we might not win, Booth said. Not for a minute, Bruno replied serenely. How do we get the dollar to Kathy? Same as always, Bruno told him. We become the Midnight Marauders. Tonight, after lights out. Mr. Sturgeon sat at the breakfast table, staring distastefully at his jack-in-the-box. Mildred, he said thoughtfully, it's too bad the Barracuda didn't win this thing. Everything else happened to her last night. Poor Miss Scrimmage, sighed Mrs. Sturgeon, pouring coffee for two. It certainly wasn't her night, as if the eggs and the owl and the rabbit weren't enough, her well-bred young ladies proved how shy and demure they really are. Let's not be smug, Mildred. The reaction of our boys was nothing to be proud of. It leaves me with the problem of what to do about Bruno and Melvin. Why, let them continue their efforts, of course, his wife exclaimed. We've never had such school spirit, the headmaster nodded in agreement. Take a boy like Elmer Drinsdale, he said. He's never taken part in anything before, and he's never had any friends. Bruno brought him into the mainstream of things. Bruno has brought him into the mainstream of things. I think all this fundraising may be good for the school, he chuckled. It's just not very good for Miss Scrimmage. Would you care for some French toast, dear? No, thank you, her husband replied. The scrimmage cake you made me eat last night hasn't quite gone down yet. A dozen or so boys were gathered around the lunch table. That brings our total that brings our total to one thousand five hundred forty seven dollars and sixty five cents, announced Elmer Drimsdale, which is six point one nine oh six of our objective. We still need twenty three thousand dollars four hundred and fifty two dollars and thirty five cents. At our present rate of income, said Chris Talbot, by the time our pool is built, our arthritis will be too severe for us to be able to swim. Not quite, said Elmer. At our present rate, we will have $25,000 in approximately 11 months, two weeks, and three days. Common arthritis does not develop so rapidly. Don't worry, Booth put in sarcastically. Bruno is buying a lottery ticket. We're going to win 100000 Oh, said, said Chris. Well, that's different. According to the odds, said Elmer... I calculate that we have a chance better that we have a better chance of being stung to death by bees than of winning first prize in the lottery. Given a choice, said Bruno, I'd rather win the money. By the way, why is it that not one of you is down on his knees to me for that glorious show last night? It was all it was my idea after all. The boys began chattering at once. Boy, those scrimmets. Elmer stole the show. The rabbit stole the show. I stole the show. The scrimmets. Face it, Miss Scrimmage stole the show. What about the amazing Frederick's mother? And when the door prize exploded in the fish's face? But the scrimmets. Yes, said Boots overly, the scrimmets. Bruno, we haven't heard the end of that. It was memorable, Bruno agreed with a smile. <clears throat> I'll never forget it seconded Wilbur Hackenschlemmer from the depths of a chicken pot pie. Bruno ignored him. Chris, he said, we need posters. You know, I do go to school here, Chris protested. You and a lot of others could end up going to school elsewhere if this campaign doesn't work, Bruno reminded him. How about this? Win a contest for McDonald Hall. Fine, Chris agreed. Now what are you talking about? Contestants, Bruno repeated. Every cereal box, every can contests, Bruno repeated. Every cereal box, every candy bar, every magazine has them. There's money and prizes out there, and McDonald Hall is ready to claim its share. Every single kid at this school will be entering contests. Whatever we win, we'll go into the pool fund. What about scrimmages? asked Mark. 
Them too, Bruno agreed. Eight posters, six for us and two for them. He slapped one of the two buckets, which formed the table's centerpiece. Grab one, Boots. We've got to take the money in to the fish for banking. To his house? Boots asked nervously. Well, he's not at the office. Besides, it's better at his house. Mrs. Sturgeon will be there, and she'd never let him kill us. If it hadn't been for her and her Tamra, moaned Butterfingers Rumpolsky, I wouldn't have chucked four eggs at Miss Scrimmage. The inside, this incited more laughter. Bruno and Boots hoisted their buckets and started out of the cafeteria building. Not two steps from the door, Boots out, let out an unearthly howl and collapsed in his tracks, pointing wordlessly toward the sky. What? 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 asked Bruno, trying to follow the wildly pointing finger. Then he saw it at the very top of the flagpole. The brown feathers stirring in the light breeze was Miss Scrimmage's hat. When their laughter died down, Bruno finally managed to say, <laughs> We can't just leave it up there. It's, uh, it'll upset the fish. Boots, you go up and get it down. Me? Why me? It was your precious Elmer Drimsdale who conjured up the owl and put it there. The owl that put it there. Let him go and go up and get it. Don't argue with me, Bruno said. We've got a chance to make some points with Miss Scrimmage. Now get up there and rescue that hat. Thoroughly defeated, Boots walked up to the flagpole and began to climb. A small crowd of McDonald Hall boys started gathering on the lawn, while across the road on a grassy hill a group of girls was forming a cheering section. When Boots was about three quarters of the way to the top and the tip of the flag to the top, and the tip of the flag was tickling his face, a sudden gust of wind lifted the hat from the pole and carried it soaring through the air. It sailed down gently onto the highway where it was immediately run over by a wedding procession consisting of approximately 30 beribboned cars, horns honking. The crowd cheered madly, and the last sight Boots saw before he slid, fireman fashion, to the ground was Miss Scrimmage standing on the balcony, waving her arms at him. Students from both schools converged on the road and stood looking down in great glee at the wreckage of Miss Scrimmage's hat. It was flat as a pancake, newly decorated with white ribbon and a cardboard sign that read, Good luck, Mary and Frank. <clears throat> a group of girls picked up the hat and carried it home to their headmistress. Boy, Bruno exclaimed to Boots, I wouldn't be in your shoes. Is Miss Scrimmage ever mad at you? It's a good thing she doesn't have her shotgun. Boots began to shout, Mad at me? Why me? I didn't do anything. You set me up there. It's all your fault. Oh, quit your crabbing, said Bruno, and grab a bucket. We've got to go and hand in this money. The two boys crossed the lawn to the small white cottage on the edge of the campus. A chance to make points with Miss Scrimmage, Boots was muttering. We made points, all right. Demerit points. Bruno rang the doorbell. Mrs. Sturgeon opened the door. Well, hello there. Come right in. We were just talking about your wonderful show. She led them into the living room. Mr. Sturgeon is on the telephone at the moment. He'll be with you shortly. We brought the money, said Bruno. Mr. Sturgeon said he would take it up to the bank tomorrow to add to our account. He held out the gold bank book for the prepared daily and a prepared daily deposit and prepared a deposit slip. From the other room, they overheard the headmaster's voice. Yes, well, thank you, Miss Scrimmage. I'll look into it right away. There was a click as he hung up the receiver, and then he appeared in the living room. I thought I heard the doorbell. He said, Ah. O'Neill, I just had a conversation with Miss Scrimmage, and your name came up. Uh, the hat, sir, Boots offered meekly. Yes, I'm told you threw it on the highway where it was destroyed by traffic. I can explain everything, said Bruno quickly. I'm sure you can, said the headmaster smoothly, but I would much rather hear O'Neill's version. Pull, said Boots, hat, flag. Wind, road, wedding, Mary and Frank. Mr. Sturgeon held up his hands for silence. On second thought, he said, perhaps I better hear Walton translate for the all this. It's really very simple, sir, explained Bruno. When Melvin saw the hat up on top of the flagpole, he wanted to do something nice for Miss Scrimmage because she got banged around so much last night. Sir, I couldn't hold him back. He was almost at the top of the pole when the wind blew the hat down onto the road. Then Mary and Frank's wedding procession came along and squashed poor Miss Scrimmage's hat. You see, sir, it was all a misunderstanding. Mr. Sturgeon turned to look out the window in order to hide. 
for the boys the expression that Miss Scrimmage's mishaps always brought to his face, part amusement, part disgust. When he turned back, his face was fully composed. I see, he said, very well. Now, to what do I owe the honor of this visit? The talent show raised $844.50, said Bruno proudly, indicating the two buckets. We've brought the money so you can bank it for us tomorrow. He paused. We're still a little short, of course, but don't worry. We'll think of some other way to raise the rent. I'm sure you will, replied the headmaster gravely. Uh, uh, question before you go, boys. Have you seen the scrimmets, uh, costumes before they went on stage? Both boys studied the carpet and shuffled uncomfortably. Finally, the headmaster said, I think I understand what happened there. You may leave. Good afternoon. When Bruno and Boots had departed, Mr. Sturgeon turned a bewildered face to his wife and asked, Mildred, who on earth are Mary and Frank? Two shadowy figures dropped to the ground from the window of room 306 and hid in the bushes until they were sure that all was clear. Bruno and Boots, each carrying a large cardboard poster, dashed across the campus to the highway, scaled the wrought iron fence, and came to a halt under the familiar window. Bruno scooped up and threw a handful of pebbles, and immediately Donna's, Diane's bl blonde head appeared. Come on up, she called softly. The two boys shinnied up the drain pipe, and Diane helped them over the sill and into the room. We were expecting you, she told them. Kathy's operating the kitchen. We like to entertain in style. The door opened and Kathy Burton appeared, wheeling a laden tea cart in front of her. Hi there, she greeted them. Good pickings tonight. Leftover roast beef, chocolate cake, help yourselves. All four devoted the next ten minutes to the kind of serious eating perfected by Wilbur Hackenschlemmer. Bruno, who had been the first to start, was the last to quit. Finally, he said, my compliments to room service. That was great. Now to business. There are posters. These are posters for our latest fundraising plan. The idea is to enter every single contest you can find. All winnings go to the pool fund. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a crumpled dollar bill. This is for our lottery ticket. Buy a winner. I didn't know they sold lottery tickets at the museum, Diane commented. They don't, said Kathy. Everyone else is going to the museum. We're going shopping. Diane nodded in resignation. I was afraid of that. Tell me, Boots asked, changing the subject. Do you girls get into trouble over those costumes? No, said Kathy airily. We told Miss Scrimmage that you and Bruno talked us into it. Boots held his head and said nothing. Bruno laughed in appreciation. Well, we better get going. We'll be back tomorrow night to pick up the ticket. What's on the menu? Liver, said Diane, loathing. We have chicken on Mondays, offered Bruno. Good, said Kathy. Tomorrow night we'll visit you. But, Boots protested in horror, see you tomorrow, said Kathy as she hustled them out the window and down the drain pipe. Sir, we have three new ideas for raising money, and we thought we'd better check them out with you. Mr. Sturgeon sat back at his chair and sighed. Go on, Walton. Well, sir, began Bruno, Gormley is having a fall fair next weekend. We'd like to go and enter Wilbur Hackenschlemmer in the pie-eating contest as a $10 prize, and Wilbur would be a cinch. He can eat more pies than they can bake, Boots added. Mr. Sturgeon had visions of himself sitting beside Wilbur in emergency. Wilbur was having his stomach pumped. His parents had to be informed. I absolutely forbid it, he said firmly. I will not permit you to play games with another boy's health. Well then, sir, Bruno went on undaunted. Tomorrow night in the fifth race, at Woodbine, there's a horse called Cloudy Sunshine. Elmer Drimsdale figured the odds, and sir, he just can't lose. So would you take $10 of the pool money and bet it for us? I most certainly will not, Mr. Sturgeon exclaimed. But sir, he's a long shot. We'll profit. That will be quite enough, Walton, and you too, O'Neill. This money was paid to you in good faith by people who believed they were helping the pool fund. You cannot misappropriate it. For purposes of gambling, I do not approve of gambling. Oh, well then, stammered Bruno. We'll just have to think of something else. Mr. Sturgeon stood up. You said three ideas, he pointed out. Or, you said three ideas, he pointed out. And you have mentioned only two. What is the third? Oh, you'd hate it, sir, said Boots earnestly. Nevertheless, I think I'd like to hear it. Well, sir, Bruno began, I thought we could have a Monte Carlo night. Nothing big, you understand, just a little blackjack, roulette, maybe a crap table or two. Oh!
thundered Mr. Sturgeon. Good day! Boots put the finishing touches on the chicken sandwiches while Bruno stirred the lemonade. Have you finished the letter to your folks yet? Bruno asked. Oh yes, Boots assured him. This time it was all about a French class that was très, fant fr that was très fantastique. To me, they're all about as subtle as a train wreck. I said my father was an athlete, not a muscle head. Keep it up, ordered Bruno, or your next letter home is going to be postmarked to York Academy. Yes, I know, said Boots. Gobble, gobble. The girls should be here soon, Bruno yawned. Yeah, it's after midnight. As if in reply, several small pebbles sailed through the open window and landed in the lemonade. A voice from outside exclaimed, Oops! And there was high-pitched giggling. Bruno and Boots rushed to the window and hauled Kathy and Diane over the sill. Shh! Boots whispered frantically. We have a housemaster. Kathy nodded. What's for eats? I'm starved. Chicken sandwiches, said Boots. And lemonade on the rocks, said Bruno. Your signal landed in the drink. There was more giggling, followed by a sharp rap into the door. Walton, O'Neill, you sound like a couple of girls in there. Pipe down and go to sleep. When they were finished eating, Kathy handed over the lottery ticket. Your number is 41965, she told them, and I hope you win. We met some turkeys from York Academy in town today. They are just impossible about beating you in the swim about beating you in the swim meet. Aren't you glad you kicked one of them? Diane said with a grin. I guess we may as well tell you, Bruno said, that there's a good chance Moose Boots might end up at York Academy because of their athletic program. Kathy slapped both hands over her mouth to suppress the screech of protest that rose from her throat. But, but you'd be a turkey, she managed to whisper in, in Boots' face. Yeah, we're working on it, Boots replied. Kathy, we can't say much longer. Diane said nervously. Kathy nodded. We better split, she agreed. She turned to Bruno and Boots. When you win the lottery, can we come swimming in your pool? Only if you make your bathing suits and sewing class, Bruno grinned. Bruno and Boots helped the girls back out over the sill and watched until they disappeared into the darkness. And that's the end of chapter seven.